As I'm finishing up work on my latest presentation talking about low stakes games, it reminded me that we haven't had a real chance to kind of catch up about personalization when it comes to the video game industry and why it is such an important point for consumers today and what developers need to keep in mind when they're giving players this variety of options. Personalization and customization, as we've said before, are often conflated, and it's important, as always, to define what we're talking about. Customization refers to any kind of choice the player makes that has some way, shape, or form effect on the gameplay. Weapon, class, uh, racial bonuses, uh, your ship, your ship's guns, guns on guns, and again, so on and so forth. Personalization refers to any choice that the player can use or do to define their characters that has no gameplay implications. Um, height, weight, gender, hair color, hair style, hair length, uh, necklaces, jewelry, rings, so on and so many more. And when we talk about this in terms of how much personalization has grown over the last few years, it really has become a major part in the last decade or so. Back in the late 80s and the 90s, the amount of personalization we had was simply name a character after your friends or family, or in XCOM's case, do you want a generic looking military soldier or a Guile impersonator? The answer, of course, is Guile impersonator. And kind of, we saw some of the major pushes in terms of personalization come with the rise of the MMO genre, with the likes of EverQuest, World of Warcraft, many, many games that had online in their title, and so on. And part of this has to do with some of the major reasons for the popularity of personalization, is that it allows people to create something that is uniquely theirs. And that cannot be understood enough as a major motivation to play games. With that said, everyone has different degrees in terms of how far they go with personalization. For me, basically, does my character have brown hair and brown eyes? We're done. If I have to name a character, I will just put a random string of letters together. If it ends in like an IA or just an A, I'm going to make that a female character. That is the extent of my character building. And then you have people who will define every single facet of a character, you know, down to the exact curvature of their face. And for people who've played the Soul series or RPGs, you have probably have heard the term fashion souls, and that is very real. That's not about being able to kill monsters, it's about being able to look good doing it. In Bloodborne, my character would wear a top hat and a monocle. Does that help me when I fight Lovecraftian werewolves? No but it makes me look dapper, and that's very important. And personalization is something that has grown in terms of the extent of which that people have come to expect. When we first started to see it, kind of the limits was, again, like hair color. Pick, you know, 30 different shades of generic white male protagonists, and that was it. And it has come a long way, and it's something a lot of people have come to expect from games, especially those that allow you to basically define characters or set something up that is unique. One of the major examples about this is, of course, Animal Crossing New Horizon, which has kind of taken over the Twitterverse for a few months. I think people are still talking about it. And one of the reasons why is the amount of personalization the game affords. That it's not just you making a character. You can build a home. You can decorate the home however you see fit. You can create personalized items you can then send to other people. And that's another very big point about personalization, something that people expect. That you, there has to be a way to show it off to people. One of the simplest ideas is, of course, having some kind of workshop feature for custom mods. Some games, of course, screenshots. Some games let you export characters or GIFs or things like that. But 
The important point about personalization, where this can become kind of a double-edged sword that we'll talk about in the second part of this video, is that people expect to be able to show it off. It doesn't really help when you're playing a single player game that you do all this fancy editing and such and nobody will ever see or hear of it. But when you can share that with people and in some cases, you know, allow it to become very popular or grow because of it, it can be such a great feeling. Some developers or we've seen some mods for games have gone above and beyond the Call of Duty in terms of new cosmetic options, uh, details of clothing, face, uh, body types, and so on, like we did with XCOM or XCOM 2. There was a game in City Skylines, there was a time where a, mo a one of the developers of SimCity 5 actually went in and designed his own custom buildings that could then be downloaded or added to City Skylines. And he did that for some time, I think until he actually got a, a full-time job. And again, being able to add a personal touch really does mean a lot for people. And it's not just for kids. It's when we talk about the idea of escapism when it comes to the video game scene, that is a topic in of itself that we could certainly spend a lot of time on. But when you are playing a game and you're trying to represent you yourself in that game, whether it is, you know, how you look in real life or how you would want to look in real life, being able to make that character and make it uniquely yours does so much for that experience. And like I said a few minutes ago, this doesn't apply to everybody. For myself, I do like to personalize like pets or, you know, equipment that I use just because I it's something that I'm going to be seeing on the screen constantly. And that is another very major point about this. When we talk about personalization, anything, and I do mean anything, can be personalized given enough time, attention, and of course, money. Because it can take a lot of money to add all these options. Because no matter how many you add, people will always want more. You have 50 different hats, they'll want another 70. You have 47 different wallpaper combinations, they want more. And this is why being able to ship or have mo editing or modding tools within the game can kind of help you get around this. Because instead of you having to Instead of being demanded to make hundreds and thousands of different clothing and furniture options, let the player do it themselves. And that's what we saw with Animal Crossing. And how people have taken, you know, personalized items, uh, companies or famous people have taken their logos and such and put them in the game. And again, it's a way of building a community and more importantly, being able to show yourself off within these games. Now, obviously the footage up there is from Stardew Valley. And Stardew Valley is one of those games that again, it allows you to do a lot in terms of personalization over your farm, how your house looks, how your character looks, who you decide to marry or date, and so on and so forth. And again, this is a game where you are creating a custom character. When we talk about personalization in terms of unique or characters that are fixed within the game space, that is another conversation. Because you're dealing with a character who is not being created by the player. So you do want to at least keep to some kind of in-universe explanation. Although some developers will just say screw it and create all manner of weird outfits, as we saw with the various events in Monster Hunter World. And again, the amount of personalization you can give to an item or give to a player will help kind of pull them into the world. But as with a lot of things that we talk about that are kind of supplemental to the experience, they're not going to fix a bad game. It doesn't matter if you have the most realistic hairstyles and hair physics in your game if it's horrible to play. But when we talk about games that are about player-generated characters or giving the player a space that they can define for themselves, personalization is a very 
big role in that. With that said, though, it can come back to bite either the consumer or the developer in specific ways. And we're going to talk about that, but first, a quick break. And now for a quick shout out to our current Game Wisdom supporters and sponsors. Going forward, all Patreon supporters will get early access to our videos. And if you'd like to continue this discussion on game design, be sure to check out our Discord channel, link down below. If you're looking for more wisdom about game design, be sure to check out my latest offering of books, 20 Essential Games to Study, aimed for first-time developers and students looking for some inspiration for their upcoming games, and Game Design Deep Dive Platformers if you're interested in anything regarding 2D and 3D platforming design. They're both available in print, digital, and wherever books are being sold. The good news is that I don't have any footage of games that have manipulated or done bad things when it comes to personalization. The bad news is it means I don't really have a link to show here, so enjoy some footage of me hopefully getting good at Dark Souls 3. As we said, personalization is a very big deal, how, and how it gets applied to a game can come back to hurt somebody if it's not handled right. So, one of the first examples of this kind of discussion is that if the game kind of hides or downplays the person's ability to personalize, it can be viewed as kind of a uh, betrayal of that system. And what we mean by that is if you let the player make choice about how their character looks or behaves or their voice or anything like that, and then that gets ignored, downplayed, or altered during the game itself, it can be viewed as a betrayal. Such as one of the more popular examples, that you can define your character however you see fit, but then in cutscenes they're going to use the weapon that, they're, that the game was programmed around, they won't talk, or in many cases they're not even going to be referenced by anyone in it. In uh, Code Vein, for instance, you can define your own personalized character who will be the chosen one save everybody, and they'll just go and completely talk around you and you have no say or input. At least one of the things about Dark Souls is that there's typically nobody around really for you to talk to, and everybody else is just trying to kill you, like you see right here. Now another point, if you let the player make a choice and then remove or uh, alter that choice in a way that betrays what that player wanted, that can be seen as being really bad, as we saw with Assassin's Creed Odyssey, and letting the and essentially retconning how the player defined their character in terms of relationships. And there is this whole outcry over if you could define your character being one way in terms of uh, who they want to sleep with or their sexual orientation, and then the game forces them to get married and have kids anyway. And again, it doesn't sound like that big of a deal, but if your whole point, or if you are building your game around this idea that you can create the character that you want, and then you tell the player, no, 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 you can't do that, we're going to do it like this, then what was the point of that system to begin with? And this is again one of those things you have to consider when you are designing games today. Another point is that when we look at games that are built around personalized characters, people expect certain options. And we're talking again about things such as gender, skin color, nationality, things along those lines. If you are designing a game that's supposed to be taking place in a modern or modern-ish type setting, and you can only create a straight, straight white male character, expect to get some backlash over that. And one of the things that we've been seeing more discussions about is having same-sex options when it comes to relationships in games. Especially those, again, that allow you to date or marry specific characters or people within that game space. And again, for some of you watching this right now, what I just said, you 
do not care about one way or the other. You're probably more interested in me failing in Dark Souls 3 right now. And again, personalization means different things to different people. And if you want your game to be viewed as more inclusive and be more approaching to a wider audience, then personalization is something you have to consider. Now, there is one other dark side to this that we need to mention, and that is the peer pressure surrounding personalization. And I know you're, again, probably scoffing at this, but for games that make use of kind of different quality tiers of personalization, you know, fancier clothing, shinier weapons, graphical effects, and so on, this stuff can be used as kind of a status measure by other players. That, oh, you're still using the generic version of that weapon, or your armor doesn't have any particle effects, and you must be a poor, crappy player. And we can see this in games where they'll start you off, or they'll only allow like a new player or a free player to have like the most generic or basic character and personalization options. And this stuff can come back to hurt players. Because there are people, like we've said, who will go after somebody if they're using the stock character or the stock personalization options. And it leads into the situation of being forced to spend money in order to, again, keep up with the Joneses. Oh, you're using last month's uh, fancy armor. Well, you don't have this collection <laughs> and things like that. And again, this is that issue when it comes to personalization. Why allowing the player to create their own stuff gets around a lot of these issues. With that said, you, as a developer, it does afford you the ability to do fancier things. As we saw with kind of the premium or uh, special uh, cosmetic options in games like League of Legends, where they create a brand new skin, unique sound effects, and things like that for a character. And any, cha any ways that you can allow a player to look unique or different from everybody else is ultimately a net positive. But, again, you have to be careful about what kind of atmosphere you are generating. And if you want people to really be able to enjoy themselves, then you have to give them the freedom to be able to personalize, as well as the freedom to be able to do it without being ostracized for their choices. There's been a, some recent issues about with World of Warcraft and removing the option to have to pay to change the gender of a character. And that is another very big point. Personalization options, you have to be really careful about charging for them. There was an issue, or there have been discussions for years about how cosmetic options are okay for microtransactions because, you know, they don't affect the gameplay. But as we've said, People want to be able to personalize, and if you hold something that they really want at ransom, essentially, something that will define who they are, who their character wants to be, that can be seen as some of the worst things you can do. And the fact that Blizzard actually wanted to ch has been charging people to change the gender of their character for years now really just boggles the mind as I think about it. And Again, you can charge people, or it's okay in a sense, to add in new cosmetic options and new features. But there has to be, you know, some measure in terms of what you give the player for free. And again, this is again why modding and customized content like that have gone over so well. XCOM in particular has done really well in terms of workshop support and allowing players to really just create anything and everything that they want. And as another important point, if somebody makes a free cosmetic option, do not steal that and then put a price tag on it, because that will really come back to haunt you and your studio. To wrap things up, personalization is a major point 
about being able to create a unique experience that is tailor-made for each player. While it is not the be-all, end-all importance of designing a game, any title that allows you to build your own custom character or build a place that is supposed to be uniquely yours, you need to consider personalization. And like we said, no matter how many options you add, people will always want more. And if you can, Try to come up with a way to have editing tools within the game. Titles like Dark Souls, Monster Hunter World, and some of the other ones we've seen have made use of extensive character cus I'm sorry, character personalization options. But you can always go further with it. And while it may not matter to everybody, it can do a lot to invite people into your game who don't want to play as generic male dude 47 or, you know, standard brunette female 22. So with that said, for those of you watching this, and before anyone says it, I know I didn't bring up Warframe as an example of personalization, but they're also really great in that regard. Can you think of any other examples of games that did a really great job of personalization? And can you think of titles that try to manipulate the player? in some way to get them to spend money on personalization options. Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching and come back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom where exactly are in science of games. Until next time, take care. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoy things, be sure to do all the liking and subscribing that the kids are doing these days. Check out our Discord channel link down below where we hang out and chat game design and come back later tonight for our regular streamings. But that's it, and tune in for more great content here and on Game Wisdom, where we examine the art and science of games.